Late last year, the Argentinian president, Cristina Fernandez, walked into an angry press conference. There had been riots, looting, vandalism across the country. The country was a mess. Why? One of the reasons was that the police had been on strike. Because, at that time, in Argentina, police wages were linked to the official rate of inflation. And so that when the government said that prices are going up 10% a year, it also meant that wages go up 10% a year. But what every policeman and almost everyone else in the country knew was that actually, when they went to the local shops, prices were going up two, three times as quickly. So that in real terms, they were able to buy fewer and fewer goods with their monthly salaries. They were getting poorer, so they went on strike. So what I did when I saw this press conference was I went online to a project run out of MIT called the Billion Prices Project. Now what the Billion Prices Project does is it scours the Argentinian internet for price data. And it pulls it down and totals it up and tries to get a rough proxy for what inflation is. So it goes to the eBay of Argentina, the Amazon of Argentina. And it says, for example, that a microwave last month cost $100. This month cost $120, therefore prices have gone up 20%. It does this with every good in real time and pulls it into an index. So when Cristina Fernandez said that prices were going up 10% a year, I looked and you saw that prices were actually going up by 30% a year. Now, we have the ability to hold her accountable and say, not only are you the cause of the riots fanning out across your country, but you are lying to your people. But it's not just that we're able to hold bad policymakers accountable. We can also help the well-intentioned policymakers understand the economy better and therefore make better decisions. Before I came to the GSB, I was an economist focused on China. And I used to go and speak to people at the US Treasury Department, the Bank of England, and the number one question everyone had was, can we trust the Chinese data? Short answer is no. <laughs> But it's not really because the government is manipulating the data, although they do that a little bit. It's mainly because China is such a vast and fast-changing economy that the government themselves don't have the tools to collect accurate and timely data. And one of the key data sets is trade, exports and imports. How much is coming out of the country, how much is going into the country. And this is such a critical gauge because it allows you to get an insight into the health of the Chinese economy. But more than that, because China is the world's largest exporter, it's a wonderful gauge and insight into the health of the global economy. But we couldn't trust the numbers. So what we did is we went online. And we looked up this data, AIS data. And what AIS does is it tracks, in real time, the location of ships across the oceans. And so you can pull it up and watch the ships move across the oceans. And so what we did was counted. One, two, three, four. We counted them up, and when you total that and tally that with what's on those ships, you can get a pretty accurate picture of what's going on in China's trade in real time. So that, at the beginning of 2013, when the official data was showing that China's trade picture was improving, we knew it would only be temporary, because the ships weren't there. But it's more than just helping out to policymakers in developing countries. It's also developed markets, too. Here, in the US, for example, late last year, the US government shut down. We had 800,000 workers temporarily out of a job. They killed all non-essential services. And the government knew this would have a huge impact on the US economy. They didn't know how large an impact. It was hard to quantify. And this is critical in the US, because in the US, Consumer spending accounts for over 70% of GDP. But they didn't have a way of understanding the impact of the shutdown on the consumer economy. 
What we're now able to do is to go on and pull data from places like Foursquare and Twitter and see where users have been checking in. Starbucks this morning, Walgreens, Walmart this afternoon. Pretty boring, right? <laughs> you could tally that, total it up, and extrapolate out and get a pretty accurate picture of what the US consumer is doing in real time. And if we'd done this, we could have gone to the government and said, because of your inaction, you have cost the US economy $10 billion, $11 billion, $12 billion. Five years ago, we had no way of disproving the claims of President Fernandez. We had no way of double checking the Chinese trade data. We had no way of quantifying the impact of US government inaction. And now we do. I want to repeat this point because I think it's really important. Now, we have the ability to hold bad policymakers accountable and to help good policymakers make better decisions. We have that ability, but we're not using it. Instagram, Farmville, Snapchat, these are great products. These are clever people. Instagram. With that, people across the world can share experiences. They share photos. Farmville, people let off steam, play some games. Snapchat, people, well. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't it be amazing if we took our combined intellect, time and resources and focused them on something bigger? If we had startups that were calling out politicians, if we had startups that helped investors with better, more timely, accurate uh, data make better investments in education and health. Here at Stanford, we think a lot about the outsized impact we can have on business. We think a lot about that. We think less about the outsized impact we could be having on government. Now, for the first time in history, we have the ability to play a truly active and engaged role in running our country, whether in government or not. And so I ask you, if you're interested in helping to run a business, might you also be interested in helping to run a country? Thank you.